Okay, yeah. five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of Art Escapes, Virtual Tours Through Asia. My name is Nicole, and I will be your moderator for today's program. Uh, today, we are going to focus on the rise of Buddhist art in China with uh, Dr. Fan Jeremy Zhang. He is our curator of Chinese art. And while everybody is filing in and getting comfortable, I just want to kind of go over the overview of today's program. Many of you have been here before, so I'm sure this is familiar to you and it's all old news. But just in case this is your first program, I just wanted to give a brief introduction for what to expect today. So we're going to go through this PowerPoint greetings and introductions first. Um, you are going to meet our curator and then we will see the rise of Buddhist art in China video. Afterwards, we are going to have a Q&A session where you get to drop your questions into that Q&A and then we get to answer them. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of fun. But before we get started, we always wanna do a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the Asian Art Museum sits on the San Francisco Peninsula and is located with in the unceded territories of the Ohlone's people, Ramatush, and coastal Miwok. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to them as we live, work, and learn on their traditional homeland. We offer our respect to the elders and to all indigenous peoples, past and present. So, Let's get to know each other a little bit. Um, I like this part. Um, so at the beginning of every program, we just want to get everybody really familiar with um, all of the controls. And so if you look at your screen, there are a couple of different things that you will see. Um, and so there is the chat feature. That one, you can talk to everybody. You can chat with each other. You can drop your thoughts into the chat. You can drop your opinions. You can, If you're inspired, just throw it in there. That way you can kind of banter back and forth and talk with each other. However, if you have a question that you would like us to answer during the program, we ask that you put it in the Q&A. So the Q&A are those two little uh, kind of thought bubbles <laughs> that are right next to each other. And those uh, will be seen by the people that are working in the back end, Sarah, my cohort, and she will be the ones who are taking the questions from the Q&A and giving them to the curator and myself to answer. And so let's have a little bit of practice. Um, let's, play, let's play with the chat. So many of you have been following this uh, program since we launched it back in February, and we have covered so many topics. We have talked about bamboo baskets, Chinese bronzes, Chinese ceramics. We've traveled all across the continent and talking and spoken about so many different mediums of art, but we can't cover everything. <laughs> and I was just wondering what other topics or regions would you be interested in taking a virtual tour of? And so when you drop your answers into the chat, please just remember to change it so that it says panelists and attendees so that you can all talk to each other. Everybody can see about everybody else's answers. And I would love to see what you would be very interested in watching in the future. Um, Nepal, any and everything. I like that one. <laughs> Mongolia. Um, yeah, there's so many different regions and so many different mediums of art that we haven't been able to cover. And we do plan to continue this series. It'll be in different reiterations. We'll have some that focus on our exhibitions. We're going to have a lot of variety in these virtual tours that we will be having in the future. And if you don't already subscribe to our newsletter, I highly recommend doing that because you will be the first to know anytime we launch new virtual programs. A program on jade, Chinese scholars, uh, gardens, Japanese ceramics, traditional and contemporary. Very cool, lots of different ideas in there. And then you may be wondering what's new at the Asian Art Museum. So we have something really cool coming up, Team Lab Continuity. Team Love Continuity will be our next special exhibition that is launching later this month. So if you are a member, you will be the first to see Team Lab. We have a member preview week coming up starting on July 16th and only members can get in. And so if you wanna be the first one to see this immersive multi-sensory exhibit, sign up for a membership. You will be the first ones to see it. Um, just in case you aren't a member or you're unable to sign up for a membership at that time, it's fine. You can still come see Team Lab. You just see it a week later. <laughs> it opens on July 21st, 23rd to the public, and uh, tickets are available on our website right now. They are going very quickly. 
uh, the first two opening weekends of Team Lab have sold out, but we have tickets on sale through the end of September. So there is still a lot of time to see it, a lot of time to book tickets, but I highly recommend that you get those tickets as soon as you can so that you get the dates and times that you like. And then just general information about the Asian Art Museum. We are open. Um, we are also open tomorrow on the 4th of July. It is our free day. And so we are open on Thursdays. That's our late day from 1 to 8 o'clock. Fridays through Mondays from 10 to 5. We're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And if you're a member and you're interested in Team Lab, we're going to have members only hours. Some days will be open later. Some days will open earlier. So you'll have a lot of opportunity to check out the exhibition and get that like kind of like personal time in there where there will be less people milling about. <laughs> um, membership levels start at $89. And then we have a variety of different levels after that that have a lot of different benefits. Um, but all of the core benefits are the same. You get invitations to member only events like the member preview or the virtual member lounge. Um, you get discounts in our boutique, the cafe, which is just uh, back to reopening. They reopened a couple of weeks ago and are almost back to their regular full hours. And then you will always get free admission into the Asian Art Museum, including its exhibition spaces. And who am I? We've probably met before. My name is Nicole. <laughs> I oversee the guest experience department, the ticketing um, information desk, coat check, private tours, accessibility resources. We, we do a lot here in the guest experience department and including hosting these virtual tours. Um, but you're not here for me. You are here for this person. This is Dr. Fanzang. He is the Barbara and Gerson Bakar Curator of Chinese Art. Um, and he is the head of the Chinese Art Department at the Asian Art Museum. He holds a PhD from Brown University and an MA from Vanderbilt University in the history of art and archaeology. He was trained in, at college as an archaeologist and conducted excavations at Kublai Khan Sanadu in Inner Mongolia. He previously served as the Asian art curator at John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida and the Smith Museum of Art in Northampton, Massachusetts. He uh, uh, launched Asian art galleries at both museums. And he is a lecturer and he has uh, served in research positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Rhode Island Mus School of Design and uh, Design Museum in Providence, and the Field Museum in Chicago. As an expert on East Asian art and archaeology, he has a broad academic interest that include material culture of China's conquest dynasties, ritual and theater, and Songyan societies, Chinese ink paintings, and the early history of East Asian art collections in North America. So welcome. Welcome to the program. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see all of you here virtually. Um, thank you, Nico, for introducing me. And also thank Michael and uh, Sarah for preparing everything. I really appreciate the great job did by Steve and uh, Mira for editing the video and preparing everything for this art escape series. So um, today um, we will discuss the rise of Buddhist art in China as you have uh, seen. The Buddhist art has been displayed in many galleries of Asian art museum because we use it as a main storyline to introduce Asian art to show its flowering and the variation in many regions and the time um, periods. So um, I, I think um, many of you might have visited our newly renovated Chinese religion gallery, which finished in 2019. Uh, well, we selected from uh, over some 300 works of sculpture art to display the development of Buddhist art and other religious um, art in China. And uh, those uh, groupings and uh, new installations mainly answer two questions. First, how was Buddhist art introduced to China and the rise to the mainstream of Chinese art? And secondly, how uh, uh, did Buddhist art take deep roots in um, local communities and became an integrated part of popular religion in traditional China. 
I think today's video and discussion mainly focused on the first question, talking about the rise of Buddhist art in mainland China. I hope this talk will inspire you come to the museum to visit those Buddhist sculptures in the near future. So without further ado, let's start watching this short video. Welcome to the Asian Art Museum. I'm Fan Jeremy Zhang, Barbara and Gerson Baker curator of Chinese art. The Chinese collection has about 8,000 works of art that covers the 5,000 years of Chinese history. They are displayed in nine galleries on both floors of the museum. Today, I'm going to focus on six Buddhist statues to talk about the story of Buddhist art in China. The spread of Buddhism and Buddhist art is a major storyline in introducing Asian art. Buddhism originated in ancient India around 500 BCE and was introduced to China in the first century CE. So how did Buddhist art spread to China? By whom and for what purpose? Bearing these questions, let's start the journey. The very first piece I'd like to show you today is this Mangli tree, a very real burial object from an ancient tomb dated to the second century CE. This piece has a bronze tree inserted into a glazed pottery base, and it carries the ancient beliefs of Mangli growing trees that people would like to have then accompany those deceased in the afterlife so they can live with abundance and wealth in the next world. You can see the renderings of Chinese mythology integrated with Buddhist motifs. Here on the top, we can see Queen Mother of the West seated on her throne, lifted by a dragon on the right and a tiger on the left. It is very interesting to see how Buddha was inserted in the rendering of the Western paradise at the time as a doorkeeper on the way to the paradise. By that time, Buddha might be treated as some kind of minor deity in the ancient pantheon of Chinese mythology. You may wonder how Buddhism was introduced from India to China. It is through the Silk Road, a known network that connected the Mediterranean world and ancient China. I want to emphasize three points about the Silk Road so you can have a better understanding of this important traffic network in ancient world. First, the Silk Road is not a long route, but it is a massive network of many short routes that extended throughout the whole Eurasia. Secondly, the Silk Road's traffic is not one way only. Actually, it has multiple directions. Thirdly, the Silk Road is not only for silk and other commodities, but also for religious ideas and the cultural values. Lots of travelers, including merchants and envoys, traveled on the Silk Road for political and commercial purposes. Here we see a very vivid representation of the camel, a major vehicle used by those caravans that connecting ancient China and Central Asia at the time. Here you see between these two humps 
a large load of goods put on the two sides of the camel. Besides, you can also see a musical instrument, a pipe, and on the other side, wine ewer that possibly would be used by the traveler to entertain themselves. The three color glaze technique applied on this camel actually suggested a preference for monochrome colors influenced by the fashion from the West at the time. Because in Chinese ceramics, people prefer to have monochrome glaze. But because of the Silk Road trade, people accepted this kind of splendid colors. So this kind of three-color glaze technique invented in the 7th century possibly give another interesting evidence to suggest the cultural impact spread along the Silk Road. This is seated Buddha dated to 338, a masterpiece of the museum and also perhaps the most valuable piece in the Chinese collection. The date on the back says the year of 338, or the first year of the Jianwu reign of the later Zhao dynasty, marked it a very important piece in the development of early Buddhist art. In my opinion, this piece has its importance not only for the earliest recorded date, but also it is the very first Chinese adaptation of an Indian prototype. So the Buddhist art could be better accepted by native believers. Here we can see the very Chinese look like face of the Buddha, very different from earlier Gandharan prototypes. And also his straight hair, the evenly laid out rope, as well as this inward facing overlapped palm. They are all very Chinese styles, in my opinion. From lots of interesting details, we can try to imagine how it originally looked like. You can see the hole on the top of his hairdo, possibly support a parasol associated with royalty. The protrusion scroll from the back of his head once supported a body halo associated with the implication of enlightenment in Buddhism. In the next two centuries, Chinese artisans continued to recreate the image of Buddha according to the aesthetics of local believers. This is a good example to show the Chinese adaptation of the Indian prototype, which renders Buddha along his two bodhisattvas standing on lotus before a flame-shaped backdrop, also known as mandola. The deities actually reflect the Chinese style of the Buddha in slender body, narrow face, long eyebrows, and Chinese style robes with flying ribbons. Vividly catered to the preference of local believers. If the previous stone stele of a flame-shaped backdrop still followed the Indian prototype. This stone stele probably marked a Chinese curation in the 6th century. Here you can see the hybrid of different building images of Eastern wooden temples and Indian stone grottoes. But also you can see leeches laid out on the surface as cave temples carved out of a stone cliff. This is a very Chinese form. 
In the center, we can see the assemblage of Buddha and his principal disciples and the two other bodhisattvas. On the top, in the space framed by the two dragons, we see the famous debate between Bodhisattva Manjushri and the wealthy layman Vimalakati on Buddhist doctrine. This debate suggests even lay person can argue Buddhist doctrines with Buddhist beings, including bodhisattvas or enlightened beings. This debate also symbolized that one could honor Buddhist values as well as Confucian obligations at the same time. In other words, the outside Buddhist religion does not conflict with the native growing Confucian ideas. That's a very smart way for Buddhism to thrive and avoid potential conflicts with religions native to China, such as Taoism and the Confucianism. So this is one of my favorite pieces in the Chinese collection, the Maitreya Buddha head from the second half of 8th century. This piece in the monumental size was actually carved out of the central deity in the middle cave of the Lei Tai complex at the Longmen Grottoes, a famous Buddhist site patronized by the royal court for centuries. This piece, even though its size is quite huge, but still you can see the artisan paid tremendous attention to details such as the lip, the eyes, and also the hairstyle. So even though that Maitreya Buddha head had been removed from the original site, we can still imagine how the original cave looked like by examining a similar but smaller Buddhist stele here in the gallery. You see the same deity, Maitreya, seated in the center with his legs pendant. He is accompanied by his two principal disciples, the younger Alanda and the elder Kathada. Also have two um, bodhisattvas, Guanyin and Da Sizi, accompanied the uh, Maitreya Buddha. On the out rim of this city, we see the seven Buddhas of the past, with two flying apsaras. And underneath, we see again the incense burner in the center, associated with enlightenment, and also the two lines symbolize the power of Buddhism. What's of more interest to me is the inscription from which we learned the patron of this daily, the Guanzhen family. And this family possibly reflect the many families living in the Tang Dynasty who personally worshipped the Maitreya Buddha and hope their future life in the Buddhist paradise could be better. Next, the Buddhist art experienced another change or development of material, the transfer from stone to wood, which make Buddhist statues more popular among the local societies. We also see the rendering of major deities transferred from Buddha to many bodhisattvas and arhats because lay persons believe that those deities compared to the formidable Buddha, they are more accessible. Here we see the statue of Bodhisattva Guanyin, one of the most popular and powerful deities in Chinese Buddhism. Guanyin, also known as the Bodhisattva of Compassion, has the magical power to hearing all the sufferings of human beings and save everybody who need help. This is one of the 33 manifestations of Guanyin 
who is supposed to live in an isolated isle in the mystical southern sea, also known as Nan Hai Guanyin. This deity often contemplated by the reflection of moon in the water, and the reflection implies the temporal nature of all human beings and the illusory nature of all phenomena in the world. Here we see the Guanyin seated in a gesture of loyal ease. He dressed like an Indian prince with crisscrossed scarves, ribbons, and jewelry decorated on his bell, chest, and arms. Here you can see the rendering of the deity suggests some kind of ambiguous gender identity because at that time people preferred to render Guanyin or Bodhisattva of compassion as a deity with benign and gentle face so it can attract more female believers who wished to bear sons or have a prosperous family. This large wooden statue once covered with gatho and pigments suggests the new height of Buddhist sculpture in the Song Dynasty. Well, we have spent quite some time in the galleries, so why not take a seat on the bench and have a moment of meditation before these Buddhist deities? I believe with the mutual gaze exchange with those deities, we can really obtain the spiritual inspiration. And more importantly, we can hear from those silent statues what they saw in the past and learn the historical wisdom as well as receiving the spiritual blessings from them. Thank you so much, Pam. That was a really fantastic video. I have to say, I think it was one of my favorite in the series so far. You touched on a lot of really great art pieces and there was a really good diversity in the mediums and the topics that were discussed. So everybody, please start putting your questions into the Q&A. Um, we will all start getting them organized and then uh, we will start the Q&A. So I have a question. Um, you touched on the 338 Buddha and we discussed the money tree, um, which was one of the earliest indications of Buddha's, Buddhism inside of China, but when did Buddhism come to China? Thank you, Nico, for asking this question. And I, I think this question is really important and uh, many scholars and also uh, many um, um, historians all, um, all trying to solve the problem because at the very beginning when Buddhism was introduced to China, it was more like some kind of underground religion and people or you know, small communities first um, adopted Buddhism, but it eventually accepted by the um, social elites and eventually recorded in official histories. So it took a while, maybe a couple of hundred years. The very first um, historical records appeared in the second half of the first century CE. And we uh, know that in around uh, 68 um, CE, and the emperor, because of a strange dream of two uh, golden men associated with Buddhist deities and sent and envoy to the West to request some kind of Buddhist uh, sutures. That's the start of the um, official acknowledgement of Buddhism in China. And uh, when the envoy returned with sutures, the emperor commissioned a Buddhist monastery in uh, modern day Luoyang um, to um, host those sutures and uh, the visiting monks. 
But later period, lots of people trying to push the date early and early. And we know in Tang Dynasty, some people, um, believers, uh, try to associate it with the introduction of Buddhism with the start of Silk Road. So pushing the date to the second century um, BCE, so several hundred years earlier. And anyhow, I think from lots of an archaeological material such as the Mani tree, we know that Buddhist um, art actually spread in many parts of China um, in the um, first century BCE. And uh, so that's pretty much the um, timeline, several hundred years before uh, 68 CE. Yeah. And then what were the dominant religions in China before the introduction of Buddhism? Um, I think at that time, lots of people had um, Taoism and also different forms of shamanism in different parts of the, um, uh, China. So I think the monetary is a great example to show the mix of Taoism and Buddhism at the very beginning. When people trying to introduce Buddhist deities into the Taoist pantheon in some kind of um, polite way or some kind of smart way, because they try to promote Buddha as some kind of minor deity in the Taoist pantheon at the very beginning and combine it with um, original beliefs like the um, ex Moody or world tree as a gatekeeper of this kind of world tree or lander connecting earth and heaven. So um, Buddha is some kind of deity from the West and associated with the beliefs of the Queen Mother of the West, living on the Mount Quinwen, in the place where those deceased would go after um, they passed away. So I think that's a very smart way to associate Buddha with the West, with um, Queen Mother of the uh, West, and also this kind of beliefs of um, paradise after this life. So eventually, um, Buddha became accepted by uh, lay peoples and eventually turned into some kind of mainstream belief. And then when Buddhism moved into China and mingled with Confucius teachings, did it happen easily? Or was there a lot of conflict, like when Christianity, for example, what it encountered when it moved through certain regions? Was it fairly peaceful or was, it, was there a lot of conflict involved? I, I think uh, in China, I would like to say compared to other parts of the world, uh, I, I think we can use the word peaceful uh, in most of the time, but still we have lots of conflicts. And I believe uh, for Buddhism as a, an imported foreign uh, religion uh, to China, it really faced um, several questions. First is like how it could be accepted by the popular people and became a uh, um, religion widespread in many communities. Secondly, it need to think about how to avoid conflicts with those native religions, such as Taoism and uh, uh, Confucianism, to um, smartly involved in those um, previous uh, religious idea of local people. And certainly, it also need to learn how to coexist with other imported religions at that time, because Buddhism was just one of the foreign religions. And we also have Nestorian uh, Christianity. We have Zoroastrianism and uh, many Chinese. So all those um, foreign religions um, introduced to China in um, the first few hundreds of the middle period. And uh, Buddhism really found some kind of smart way to first think the support from those uh, long Chinese rulers and also from the support of those of elite women really had some kind of power at the time, as well as from lots of common um, people. Then eventually uh, take roots in local communities in China. And I believe at that time, because of the um, social chaos, Buddhism really promoted some kind of good idea uh, to make it popular because it's like um, preaching the paradise um, concept and uh, let people know that even though they are suffering, but 
their next world and their next life will be beautiful. So lots of people are trying to put their hope and wish for the Buddhist pure land for the next um, life. And besides that, I also think um, Buddhism was quite um, acceptable by lots of immigrants to China at that point, associated with foreigners or those non-Chinese uh, conquerors of the northern end of China. So it's like a native religion associated with lots of Han Chinese and uh, Buddhism more associated with uh, non-Chinese peoples. And Buddhism functioned as some kind of very important group to have all those different ethnic um, peoples living together peacefully and uh, also uh, under the imperial power without uh, trying to making too much troubles. So this religion really helped um, those non-Chinese rulers and that's the reason um, Buddhism was really um, enhanced at a very short time period during the Northern and Southern dynasties. And then we, you spoke about the Silk Road and how it wasn't just a trade network, but it was an exchange of ideas and how everything kind of evolved as it went from country to country. And with the 338 Buddha, for example, you highlighted um, the just physical differences between Buddhism that came from India and then Buddhism that was in China. And so can you speak about the difference between Nepalese Buddhist art and Chinese Buddhist art? Um, I think uh, that's really a large question and uh, that could be uh, the topic of another series. So um, yeah, I, I, I think um, it's like uh, the bipartisan in the Christianity in the West. I, I think in Buddhism, we also have different sects. And uh, in general, we divided Buddhism into a Mahayala or great vehicle uh, section and also Hinayala or small vehicle section. So for the um, Mahayana Buddhism, it was introduced well uh, Northern India and Central Asia to mainland China, to Korea, to Japan and uh, Vietnam. And so I think that's the main part. And uh, we, uh, within that, uh, we have different sects, uh, including Pure Land Buddhism and uh, also the Chan Buddhism. In the meantime, it's like um, we have those small vehicle sects spread in South, maybe in Southeast Asia, in those uh, countries like um, Burma and uh, Thailand. And in between, we have some kind of um, tantric Buddhism tradition. And uh, that's this kind of tradition thrived in uh, Nepal and uh, Tibet. And eventually it involved other traditions in the uh, Tibetan plantier and eventually reached to Mongolia and adopted by non-Chinese rulers of the Yuan dynasty as well as the Manchu Qin dynasty. So it became quite popular in later time. Um, so either way, I, I think Buddhism is a quite complex system, a world religion, and it's adapted to different regions at different periods. Even today, I think um, it's quite complicated trying to sort out different uh, traditions and the sects of um, Buddhism. And uh, I believe um, lots of people really involved in Chan Buddhism in a later time period as well as today. And then is there like a peak period of Buddhist, uh, Chinese Buddhist art, like kind of like a golden age of Chinese Buddhist art? Um, yeah, um, I think we can think about this way. It's like waves of Buddhist ideas, Buddhist art introduced well on the Silk Road and other um, sources to China and thrived under different uh, situations. So. Like I mentioned, the Northern and Southern dynasties from the fourth to sixth century, that's the first wave of Buddhist art and it uh, uh, rise to the mainstream. 
under the patronage of lots of non-Chinese rulers. And uh, during the High Tang period, the uh, from the uh, 700 to an uh, 800, it's like we can see another golden um, period of the Buddhist art because of the imperial patronage, and lots of monasteries were built, lots of cave temples were carved out, and lots of statues, pagodas were um, casted or built. So. I think we can see that as a Nana Golden Age. And then we can suggest a, a later Song and Yuan period as the third wave of uh, spread of Buddhism because it really turned into local communities and really involved with other native religions as some kind of like daily beliefs. And a lot of people just like uh, accept them and not trying to exclude Buddhist ideas from their daily life. And eventually it's just like so beautifully, so smartly involved with Confucianism and Taoism, just like local, uh, native Chinese people believe that Buddhism is part of it. So we can see this kind of waves of, waves of um, introduction and uh, enhancement. So eventually Buddhism became some kind of important part if we want to understand Chinese religion or Chinese culture today. There we go. This one is a materials question. Um, can you please talk about the natural materials used in the color glazes of the camel? Um, this viewer um, has recognized like similar colors in other um, in other Chinese camel artworks. And so was it a style of execution or could you just talk more about the materials used in it? Um, sure. I, I think that's some kind of a great invention in the seventh century in terms of the three color glaze technique. Because before that time period, Chinese artisans made lots of pottery figurines for burials and uh, for decorations. So many of them just like um, with some kind of um, painted surface or simple lead glaze of a single color like green. But in a certain, in the seventh century because of the Silk Road trade and this kind of idea or this kind of preference for splendid colors introduced from the West and then became popular among the uh, social elites at the time. So people trying to have this kind of mixed uh, color patterns to decorate the surface of their um, daily life objects as well as those um, burial objects. Uh, and for those um, pottery uh, cameras or horses, actually they were felt twice. So first they were baked in the kim to make the um, basic shape of those animals or figures and then they were um, brought uh, they were brought out and uh, paid with uh, different glazes and uh, based on those marrow colors so uh, for instance the three color glaze mainly features three colors uh, able orange and uh, green so we know if we add iron oxide it will turn into able. And if we um, add um, those um, copper and lead based um, material, it will turn into uh, green. So uh, this kind of mix of different marrow um, colors or pigments on the surface eventually made the surface of those pottery cameras and horses into some kind of splendid um, representation of the um, color. So people really like those kind of ornaments, very similar to those textiles in their daily life. And it infected lots of preference and aesthetics in a later time period in terms of appreciation of ceramics. So um, yeah, I just hope this answers your question. And then we looked at sculptures, but were two-dimensional artworks like paintings, um, something like not made out of stone or wood, 
Were those equally common for religious expression? Um, have they just not survived or were two dimensional artworks just not done? Um, I should suggest it's like uh, when we look at religious art or Buddhist art, we just um, treat them as art of faith and art of passion. And uh, no matter two dimensional or three dimensional, for those patrons, for those creators, they um, they are like equally efficacious. So they invested um, same amount of time and energy to uh, create those um, Buddhist images or sculptures. So I believe for many reasons, those two dimensional objects, um, especially in paintings, silk banners, they're not so well preserved like durable material of stone and metal. So that's part of the reason we didn't see many of them left before the Tang, late Tang Dynasty. And uh, uh, for early silk paintings, especially those left uh, on the Silk Road, um, I, I think they are good examples for us to um, understand how those Buddhist ideas traveled along those caravans from Central Asia to China. And also for uh, murals, this kind of large application of um, paintings on the wall of those Buddhist caves. I think they are a good example for us to understand how um, believers trying to depict their uh, religious paradise. So um, paintings, sculptures, and also architectural context, they functioned as some kind of visual and ceremonial program for those believers and uh, they worked as a whole set to convince their viewers actually by worshiping those um, icons, they could eventually reach the Buddhist paradise. So um, that's my suggestion, just look at those different mediums, different materials as the same way and treat those uh, sculptures as figures of um, beliefs and as figures of reverence, same with pictures. And then a couple of our viewers have questions about the Maitreya and the cave and where it came from. Um, is it possible to know what happened to the body um, where it was in the cave where it was originally from? Um, that's quite a sensitive question. So uh, we have some kind of um, Buddhist statues actually uh, moved out from their original sites. And uh, today we know from our records where they came from and uh, sold by whom. So uh, that's a whole series of repatriation questions. And uh, uh, I just hope um, we can first have more understanding of those pieces and then we can better decide what in the future we can do to make audience better appreciate those objects, uh, those religious statues out of their original context, like the cave temple or the monastery. So for our Maitreya and Buddha head, we know it's from the middle cave of the uh, Neigu Tai complex at Lomen Grottoes. And today, if you get a chance to travel to Luoyang to visit the Lomen Grottoes, you will see um, local guys um, in, will tell you, or you know, there's a sign there just like, well, you can find the head, the missing head. Um, and our museum's name is listed there. So that's where, um, um, interesting fact. So um, I, I think um, it's like um, this will re really uh, raise lots of questions uh, if in the future people really trying to have those objects if like uh, in some way return to the original site. The good thing is like um, our museum's collection compared to other major collections in the US um, are not so um, obvious or standing on the um, top of the uh, list for 
local government in China to have those pieces uh, returned or um, rejoined to the original size. So I think from uh, other museum examples, we can better decide uh, what we can do next. Uh, like for instance, uh, Harvard Art Museums have lots of murals and statues moved from uh, Dunhuang by the archeologist or art professor um, Lagden Werner in the early 20th century. So I think from other museums examples, we can better learn how would it be um, better for us to treat our collection and uh, introduce more background information to our audience. Yeah, that's my thought. Yeah, I can imagine it's a very complex issue. <laughs> And then one of the viewers asked, how do you identify my, uh, Maitreya iconography? Uh, I, I think it has some kind of um, very, very um, um, difficult question for lots of scholars as well, especially in the middle period China, when the worship of Maitreya uh, gradually translated to the worship of Shikamoli or the main Buddha um, in Buddhism. So I think one simple way to tell um, Maitreya from uh, Shikamoli Buddha is to uh, tell how his posture was rendered, especially his legs. Sometimes you see the crossed legs or pendant legs over lotus bases. That's Maitreya. And also sometimes from inscription underneath or next to it, we can tell um, it is Maitreya or uh, Shikamuli. I, I think to me, sometimes you can see at that point, local um, believers or laymen actually did not know too much about this kind of very fine difference between this kind of Buddhist iconography. So um, I think sometimes in my opinion, they definitely is Maitreya, but on the inscription it's mentioned Shikamoli Buddha or vice versa. So I think at that time, people just like treat them um, as the deity they wish to worship. Um, and eventually in a later time period, we have more fixed um, standards in this kind of iconography to help us to decide what kind of uh, deity um, it is. So um, yeah, I um, hope it answers your question. Yeah, I think so, that's very detailed, thank you. And um, does the museum have the contents of the body cavity of the Gaiin figure? Were the contents sutras? Uh, can, can you uh, say it again? Uh, what kind of? Uh, yeah, um, does the museum have the contents of the body cavity of the Gaiin figure? Were the contents sutras? <laughs> Um, okay, the um, wooden guanyin of um, compassion. So I think we don't have anything um, left inside. So when we purchase this wooden statue, we know this kind of um, opening on the back, but the lid is missing and there's nothing inside. Sometimes there was inscription uh, on the um, surface to mention a date and uh, patron of the statue. But for our piece, we don't have any inscription on the back. So possibly the inscription missed along with the lead uh, on the back. Um, but normally put, would put sutures or some kind of um, items that they've like to put or seal in those Buddhist statues as a way to memorize their um, act of patronage because for them, um, patronized Buddhist um, statues creation is some kind of merit um, building act. And uh, the more uh, merit they accumulated, the better chance they will have to go to the Buddhist pure land. And then um, in the Maitreya Buddha head, we see that the hair looks more textured than the straight hair of the ancient Chinese Buddha. 
Does this tell us traditional Buddhist imagery was more accepted by the second half of the eighth century? Um, actually, I should suggest this way. Um, again, we need to think about waves of uh, inferences of Buddhist art from uh, India or uh, along the Silk Road. So um, I think during High Tang Dynasty, there was some kind of you know um, preference for those Buddhist statues in some kind of more uh, flashy way compared to the century before. So like I said, this is really some kind of um, topic for um, art historians to really divide this kind of stylistic development. And I should suggest like in the um, around 500, so people still um, prefer some kind of very um, Gandharan-like styles of those Buddhist statues. But after, um, 532, uh, we have a piece from that period. You can see in a certain, it's like uh, the Northern Way um, rulers patronize lots of statues, actually very Chinese looking like. So uh, we use some kind of special terms to emphasize those Chinese style Buddhist art, like Bao Yi Bo Dai. Um, or translated as um, large robes and flying ribbons and xiao gu qin xiang, um, slender body and uh, um, gentle appearance. So those are some kind of uh, characters for us to distinguish uh, Chinese style Buddhist art from uh, imported Indian prototypes. And, and this kind of trend eventually involved in the uh, around 700, when those uh, imperial patrons from the Tang court actually highlighted this kind of flash look, the rounded bodies and faces to show this kind of uh, new appearance of Buddhist statues under the influence of earlier uh, century of the Gupta styles, uh, which we use another term, Chao Yi Chu Sui, just like some people just uh, emerged from the water and you can see the body underneath the very soft and the thin rope. So we can see that's the 700. Um, for that um, material head, I would like to suggest it's like um, um, for the main statue is from the first um, half of the eighth century and then eventually the cave finished in the second half of 8th century and its uh, construction lasted uh, several decades. So um, I think for that time we can see this kind of uh, new preference because of the thriving Silk Road uh, trade. Uh, lots of like uh, new elements involved, very different from earlier, uh, very pure Chinese styles. And this kind of style changed in uh, a couple of hundred years later when people more prefer to have those deities look as some kind of um, ordinary people have some kind of secular uh, appearance. So we can see this kind of preferences um, actually keeps on changing. Okay, and it looks like we have time for one more question. So um, final question. Is there any indication that Buddhism was accepted faster by men or women, or did it seem like both genders accepted it kind of at an equal pace? Um, I, I, I think uh, that's a very interesting question. And uh, to me, I would like to suggest in the earlier time period, maybe women uh, picked up Buddhism faster than men because it's like for those women they have more needs from buddha and they would like to build a song for the family they would like to have a prosperous um, uh, claim and also they pre pray for their husbands or sons if they have some kind of military uh, march or need to travel long distance for commercial uh, or other activities. So I think um, lots of lay women actually quite exposed to Buddhism um, based on our speculation. So I think maybe women first picked up 
and bodies, especially those elite women uh, in the court, and uh, lots of patrons from what uh, left uh, today from those inscriptions left on um, statues. We know those imperial women actually functioned uh, and took some kind of important role to promote the spread of Buddhist art and the impact of Buddhism. I also want to suggest actually for Chinese, uh, they very different uh, other uh, peoples uh, in the uh, world. So it's like they have some kind of practical way in adopting their deities. So as long as the deity could be helpful or they thought the deity would be efficacious to help them reach their uh, goals or wishes. They would like to worship the deity or gods, no matter what kind of origin um, they came from. And they really uh, adopted some kind of practical way in worshiping deities. So that's why uh, lots of religions uh, from different parts of the world thrived in Chinese local communities. And many of them just uh, really open and uh, adaptable to different uh, religions and eventually created lots of mix of different icons or mix um, of different religious ideas. Um, I think if you have interest, you can read um, many scholarly books discuss this issue. And one of them is um, Professor Valerie Hansen's book, uh, Medieval Gold, um, Changing Golds in Medieval China. And the professor's book really had a very interesting discussion of this issue. Yeah. Okay, well, that is all the time that we have today. But thank you so much, Fan. You were such a wonderful, informative guest today. We really appreciate you coming on our program. So um, this is the last episode in this season of Artscapes. Um, but if you are interested in additional virtual tours, we do have some more coming up. Um, I definitely invite you, if you don't already subscribe to our newsletter, subscribe to it because you will be the first to know when we launch our next series. And um, it is currently, um, I'll put it on our website as well, but that's just the easiest way to honestly find out about all of our upcoming events. And if you are a member, you also have access to the virtual member lounge where you have lots of um, members only talks that are led by our docents and our curators. So thank you so much, Fan. I really appreciate you coming on our program today. Oh, and uh, thanks for coming to this event. I hope you all will come to the museum in person soon to enjoy those Buddhist or religious art in our galleries. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. No Bye. <laughs>